This video is sponsored by DisabilityQuotes.com. They have been helping residents and also practicing physicians find the right type of disability insurance for the past 20 years. This type of insurance ensures that your income continues when you cannot continue practicing medicine. It's important, so important that I personally have disability insurance. Click on the link below in the description for a free quote from them today. What's up everyone, this is Dr. Webb here. Thank you guys for watching this video. Please subscribe, new videos come in every week. You don't wanna miss these videos. Today I have a very special guest. She's gonna tell us all about the field of family medicine as well as osteopathic medicine, um, why she went into it, uh, some tips for you guys, and um, everything else about the, the uh, wonderful field of family medicine. Dr. Cottle, thank you for uh, joining me today. How are you today? I'm good, how are you? Yeah, good. Thank you uh, for uh, coming on to the show. I know I've been trying to uh, get you to come on for the last couple of months. Uh, you know, our schedule's kind of conflicted, but thank you uh, for coming on today. Sure. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Awesome. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell the uh, people out there who you are and kind of what, what do you do? Okay. So uh, my name is Dr. Jennifer Cottle. I'm an osteopathic family physician. Uh, I've been in practice for about 10 years. Uh, I am an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine at Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, Rowan University SOM is in South Jersey. And uh, I'm also a practicing family physician. And I do some media work as well. Um, but yeah, so I teach medical students. I'm the clerkship director for the third year family medicine clerkship at Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine. I also teach residents and precept them in the office, um, and I see patients of my own. Awesome. Uh, and going back to medical school, uh, what was it about family medicine that got you interested in? Why were you, why did you decide to go into family medicine? So, you know, I always say that picking a specialty is a personality decision. Right. I know a lot of students and even pre-med students wonder, how am, I, how am I gonna pick a specialty or how do I decide? And I always tell my students to, you know, as corny as it sounds, to listen to your heart. Right. Um, I think specialties are a lot, a lot of times personality driven. I say, you know, if you don't like to talk to people, maybe radiology is for you, anesthesia, maybe critical care. Yeah. Um, you know, if you wanna see baby pictures and, and wedding pictures and pictures of new homes, maybe family medicine is for you, yeah. um, hospital versus outpatient. But, but that's really what helped me decide. I knew when I was going through rotations that I liked almost everything. Mm. There was nothing I really didn't like. I mean, some things I preferred more than others, but I really kind of got into every specialty that I was in. And I also knew that I wanted variety. Mm. It was, it's my personality. I wanted every patient every day to be different because that's when I felt like I was most engaged when I was on my rotations. So I was like, okay, well, what rotation or what, what, specialty would give me variety where mm -hmm. I can use all these different parts of my brain. Um, yeah. And then the final thing for me that, that really did it was how to practice. You know, once I decided on primary care, which would be something like uh, ER or family medicine or internal medicine. They're all specialties. Those are all that deal with lots of variety. But I said, well, how do I want to deliver this care? What do I think of the ER setting? What do I think of the hospital? What do I think about outpatient? And what I learned very early on was I liked the hospital, but as simple as it sounds, I didn't want to only see sick people mm. in the hospital. Everyone is sick. Um, but when you're an outpatient doctor in family medicine, I do well checks. I do routine physicals when someone is not necessarily sick. And I realized that was important to me. And I also like the outpatient environment. I didn't want to be in a hospital all the time. So, you know, they're very sort of simple things that I use, but it really those were things that were part of my personality that I realized, Hey, I just, I like being in, I like having a window. Number one, I like seeing healthy people and sick people. I do like knowing how people are doing over time. That was the other reason why I say didn't choose ER is because I was always curious about whatever happened to that guy or whatever happened to that patient. And I never knew sometimes in the hospital, but as now patient doctor, I know, 
Um, so it's all these things that help me decide on family medicine. And, and that's why I say for, you know, the students or the pre-med students or even residents maybe who are thinking, did I choose right? How do I choose? Really listen to who you are as a person, because this is something that theoretically you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. And I know a lot of specialties, some seem more glamorous than others. Um, but that doesn't matter at the end of the day. What matters is what you really love and what you're passionate about. Yeah, and that's good advice. You have a lot of students who are kind of torn between different specialties and what specialty should they choose. But uh, you said that, you know, listen to your heart and kind of go after what you, you're passionate about. Uh, for the students or people out there who don't know the difference between internal medicine and family medicine, can you briefly explain kind of the difference between those two specialties? Sure. And I think that's a great question because I think for a lot of years, before med school and even my first couple years of med school, I was like, wait, what's the difference? Yeah. Um, so both family medicine and internal medicine are considered primary care doctors, mm -hmm. um, meaning we deal with a multitude of conditions. Um, we're often the first person that people see. Uh, it's a primary care specialty. But the difference is generally that in family medicine, we practice and we, we learn to treat patients from birth to death, literally. Um, in my family medicine residency, I did OB rotations, I did PEDS rotations, I did obviously geriatrics rotations, I did critical care rotations. You, you really learn um, the full spectrum in terms of ages. Internal medicine is more focused on adult medicine, typically 18 and above or 21 and above, depending on the internist. Um, family medicine doctors and internists can practice in the hospital. For years, actually, I did hospital work. And as part of our residency, you know, I was doing hospital work. So it's not that one, you do hospital and the other, you don't. Both do hospital work and can do hospital work. Both can and often do outpatient work as well. But one of the other big differences students should keep in mind is that many of the specialties, if you want to specialize in cardiology, endocrinology, um, et cetera, pulmonary, you have to do internal medicine. Yeah. Family medicine, we can specialize, um, but there's a, a, a more limited a range of things that we can specialize in. And the range of specialties available to family physicians is not the same as internal medicine. So that's something to keep in mind if down the line you have dreams of being a cardiologist, then you know, internal medicine is, 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 a, is a more appropriate route, for example. Okay. And going back to medical school, applying to you know, MD schools versus DO, I know you took the uh, DO route. Why was that? And can you talk about a little bit about the difference between the two? Sure. So I actually didn't even know about osteopathic physicians uh -huh. when I was in college. I went to Princeton, and when I was working with my pre-med advisor to put together my schools, you know, that whole pre-med thing that you do, yeah. and I was in the pre-med track, um, no one ever talked to me about DO schools. I didn't even know that there was such thing as a DO or an osteopathic physician. I only knew about MD schools. So I selected my schools to apply to, and I had my list, and uh, I actually took a year off between, um, actually a couple years off between college and applying to medical school. I, my life kind of took a few turns, and I had, you know, did some different things, but it was interesting. I came back around to applying to medical schools, and I remember sitting in my kitchen, and my mom was in the kitchen with me, and she was cooking and I was you know the internet was a baby back in those days yeah. and my mother was like well wait are you applying to osteo wait osteopath I think osteo, osteo schools I said what's an osteo school huh? yeah. she says well you know the osteo I said bone doctors <laughs> you know what everybody says <laughs> what are these bone doctors yeah. and she goes no Dr. Johnson is a, a DO a, a, an osteopathic physician now, Dr. Johnson was my doctor growing up he was our family doctor. He was a prominent African-American physician in, in Iowa, which, which is where I'm from. And he was such a mentor to me, but I had no idea he was this osteopathic doctor. Mm -hmm. So literally, I found the numbers to the American Osteopathic Association, to the American, Osteopath uh, American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine. And I literally picked up the phone and I called them up. And I was like, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, who? Who are you people and what what do you do yeah. and you know to my surprise I learned about this amazing world of medicine that I didn't know about so you say a lot of people say well what's the difference yeah. what's the difference between DO and MD so MDs medical doctors DOs osteopathic physicians we do the same stuff as you know um, dr. Webb I know that you know in fact many of my my professors in medical school I went to UMD and J School of Osteopathic Medicine many might also know that UMD and J has Robert Wood Johnson and and Rutgers as well. So UMD and J up until a couple of years ago had MD schools and DO schools. And many of our 
medical school professors taught us all. So it's the same quality of education. We learn the same types of things in terms of sciences and all that stuff. The residencies and all that stuff is the same. The difference is that osteopathic physicians, um, there's a couple of things. I think that the approach, there's a holistic approach that is, mm-hmm. that is stressed. Um, uh, MDs are holistic as well. That's not, I'm not saying that MDs are not because we work side by side. But um, uh, osteopathic physicians, we sort of pride ourselves on on a sort of a holistic, whole body approach. Mm-hmm. But there's also um, what we call osteopathic manipulative medicine. And that's the thing really that separates the two of us is that OMT or osteopathic manipulative treatment or medicine is a way to sort of diagnose and treat certain conditions, musculoskeletal conditions, uh, nonspecific low back pain. Um, but um, it's similar in that people understand the concept of using your hands when I mention what chiropractors do. So we had additional classes in OMT. Um, I'm a doctor. I believe in OMT. I don't practice a lot of it anymore um, as, I've, as I've grown in my practice. But it's, I think, a, a wonderful tool along with medications and surgery and all the other modalities that we need to treat conditions. So honestly, that's the main difference. And you go to a DO school, uh, an osteopathic medical school versus a, uh, an allopathic medical school. Um, uh, the number of DO students and DO physicians in this country is absolutely rising because there's more and more schools opening up. Um, but for me, when I heard about the osteopathic philosophy, that's when I decided that that's what I wanted. And I actually didn't apply to MD schools because I just really liked what I heard. It made sense to me. Um, and I think that's where with students, it really comes down to once again, listening to your heart, what makes sense to you as a student, as a person, as a future physician. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the integration that they were talking about in a couple yes. of years. Um, yes. Can you tell us what you know about that and what have yeah. you heard about the, that integration? Yeah, so there is an integration, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to qualify my statements and say that um, I work with the residents, but I'm not one of the residency directors, so I'm not, state of, like, I'm not, I'm yeah. not in front of the information, meaning it's not at the top of my fingertips, but just sort of in a nutshell. The idea is that DO and MD residencies are, I think it's probably safe to say they're kind of merging, so to speak. And that DO residencies, for example, are also being required to meet um, residency standards of MD residencies. And that theoretically, MDs and DOs will be able to go to both, which there are many programs already that have that. In fact, my, let's see here. I went to, let's see, I went to an osteopathic internship and residency, but many of my friends went to duly accredited programs where they had MDs and DOs in both, but not all programs are like that. So it's really kind of the merger of both for residency training, for secondary training. And that's bringing along some changes in terms of what programs have to do to meet the requirements of of our counterparts and vice versa. And, and, you know, I think it's, in many ways, I think it sort of speaks to the similarities of MDs and DOs, right? Mm -hmm. We're so similar that we practice together, we train together. Um, my first job at uh, Sinai Hospital, I was a clinical um, uh, teaching, uh, uh, a clinical, I had a cl- clinical teaching, a clinical faculty teaching position at Hopkins, but I was the only DO in the department, and you know, you, you don't notice it. Um, so I think that's something that a lot of students wonder about too: is well, um, how does it work in real life? And the truth of the matter is, you have a wear- white coat on. Patients often don't really know that there's a difference. And sometimes your colleagues, you don't know, because we practice side by side, Dr. Webb, as I know that you know, um, and um, training is is very comparable. Got you. Um, What is a typical day for you? Kind of starts at what time and ends at what time? And I know your schedule may be a little bit atypical for most family medicine physicians, because you do a lot of media as well. Um, Right. What is a typical day for you? So there is no typical day for me, but I know what you mean. Um, so I see patients in the office about two days a week okay. uh, and, and understand that I practiced full time up until maybe a year and a half ago when I started doing a lot more media. And so I have some time pulled out to do media on behalf of Rowan University. But, um, you know, in the past, I would literally see patients from eight to five every day. I would teach my course on Fridays. Uh, now my schedule is that Monday and Wednesday are what I call media days, where I'm doing interviews. I'm appearing, I today actually have a Dr. Oz episode that just aired today. I go on HLN, CNN, uh, PBS, Fox News, um, Dr. Oz, you name it, talking about health issues. Um, and so that's Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, Tuesdays, I'm in the office. Thursdays, I'm in the office seeing patients, usually like eight to five-ish. Um, but with paperwork, it actually tends to be like six or 6.30. And then uh, Fridays, I'm usually with my course, the third year family medicine clerkship at Rowan University School of Osteopathic Medicine. So, um, but honestly, I don't know what your schedule is like. I, I know that you're a, you're a resident, so I know that you're very busy, but 
I, I honestly do work all the time, actually. You know, I, I, I still take charts home. I do charts in the evenings. I do them on weekends. Um, I do think it's part of the job of medicine, um, and especially with paperwork and things like that. But, you know, I, I love my job. I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I love being a family doctor. I love being a part of people's lives and seeing them as they grow. And I, I treat whole families. I, I treat patients, a couple, and I treat their kids. I treat their parents. I treat their aunts and uncles. It's, it's really a privilege. You know? Excellent. And yeah. speaking about the, you know, I know it varies by location and where you are in your contract type, but the salary. A lot of people yes. there they may be interested in family medicine, but the salary associated with it and then their school loans Right. What do you like to say for people who are interested in family medicine, but they are kind of intimidated by the high amount of loans that they may have? You're right. And I, I think that's a very good question. And it's a very realistic thing. You know, as a primary care doctor, I do not make nearly what some of the specialists make. I mean, yeah. that's a fact. Mm -hmm. uh, you can Google what family physicians make. I think on the East Coast, my guess is that we make even a lot less than other places. Mm -hmm. um, as an academic physician, I probably make less than other physicians as well. I'm a salaried physician. I don't work in uh, private practice where, you know, I have certain bonus structures, for example, if that were the case, et cetera. Yeah. So, no, my salary is not um, – I, I wish my salary were higher. I wish the salary of primary care docs was higher than what it is. And I definitely think that it's a real consideration for students coming out. You come out of school with maybe college debt, with medical school debt, um, and then, you know, and you're in residency and you're not making much more money. Um, and then you start your life and you've got all this debt, but you're maybe not making enough yeah. to take care of all of that debt. You're making a great salary for most people in America, um, wonderfully. But when you compare it to potentially $300,000 worth of debt, it gets to be intimidating. Mm. I'll be honest with you. I still say to follow your heart. Yep. I do. Because one thing I've learned is that, well, I haven't learned this through experience, <laughs> but I don't think money buys happiness. Yeah. And I understand it can be very difficult. But, but I encourage students to, number one, pre-med and medical students, get savvy. I applied for every scholarship I could find. It was like my part-time job. Yeah. I applied for scholarship after scholarship after scholarship, minority scholarships, primary care scholarships. Now, remember, there are programs where you can work in underserved areas and to and, and receive loan repayment. Uh, there are areas where you can train in underserved areas. There, there's so many options. And also keep in mind where and how you practice family medicine makes a difference. Mm -hmm. So I have a colleague who I did residency with um, in New Jersey, and she went to practice in Wisconsin. And I would say she easily made sixty dollars to $80,000 more than me every year just because she wasn't in New Jersey. OK, so location matters. You know, I'm from the state of Iowa. If you're willing to go in places um, that offer higher salaries, that may very well help. Um, you know, but what I say is to get creative, you know, to be obviously be responsible with spending habits, to be thoughtful about future planning and to plan ahead. But applying for scholarships you want to practice. Uh, and remember, there's uh, maybe another thing, too, I should also add. In this day and age, remember family physicians can do so much, which is a blessing for us. Yeah. I know many family physicians who have gotten into doing a lot of procedures in the office. That helps with billing. They do knee injections. They may do OMT helps with billing. Um, they're taken off warts and moles. And as family doctors, we're trained to do that. The more procedures you do, the more you can bill, the more potential you can make. Yeah. The other thing is, with in the land of injectables, for example, you know, obviously we're not doing plastic surgery, but some family doctors and other doctors choose to do Botox and get trained in things like that yeah. uh, or cash services that will bring in income. So there are a lot of things that can be done. I encourage any student who's interested in primary care not to rule it out because of the salary. It's not a good enough reason to rule out something that you really might love for the rest of your life. That, that's, that's very key. And uh, that's one thing that a lot of students, when they talk to me or they email me or contact me, and that, that's one of their concerns. But I think you answered that uh, very, uh, very uh, perfectly. Um, what other advice would you have for students out there um, in pre-med or at medical school residents, residents that are about to enter in this field of medicine? What, what advice would you give to them? Well, you know, oh, where do I start? <laughs> but I'll be brief, I promise. Um, uh, being a doctor is honestly, it's the best. And I say that because I really feel like it's a privilege to be able to take care of someone, to make a difference in someone's life mm -hmm. in the way that we have the opportunity to. There is nothing like it. 
honestly, I don't think there's anything like, I feel like it's literally every single day. It's a privilege. Um, yeah, there are some days I wake up and say, Ooh, it'd be nice to sleep in. Or <laughs> some days I say, Ooh, I wish I didn't have all this paperwork, but there's not a day that doesn't go by that. I'm not grateful for this opportunity. Um, and I say that it's important that we just not forget it, you know, be grateful, um, work hard because it matters. We're dealing with people's lives. Work hard, but be grateful for the opportunity. And for those who are coming up who want to be doctors, know that you couldn't pick a better profession. And it's going to seem hard at times. It, it does for everyone. There is not one of us who hasn't thought, oh my gosh, am I good enough? Oh my gosh, are my scores high enough? Oh my gosh, am I going to do well enough? Am I going to get a residency spot? Am I going to get into med school? There's not a single person, well, there probably are a few, but most of us have had those questions. I have. I mean, every single day was a little bit of a, a battle in some ways, but stick to the course. Be determined. If this is what you want to do, you keep going and just know that it's the best profession out there. It is. Excellent. Dr. Cottle, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. Uh, if there are students out there, anyone who wants to get in touch with you or for media <laughs> contact, how can yeah. they get in touch with you? So I love hearing from people, by the way. So, you know, as chatty as I am on this, on this interview, I'm just as chatty on social media. So please follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dr. Jen Caudle. That's D-R-J-E-N-C-A-U-D-L-E. And I'm on Facebook at Dr. Jennifer Caudle. That's my page. So, um, yeah, follow me, like me, send me some messages. Let me know what, what you're doing out there. Excellent. And I will put links to those, uh, links to those uh, websites in the description below. Thank awesome. you so much, Dr. Caudle. I appreciate Thank you. Your real inspiration to uh, all of us out there who are up and coming physicians. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was really key advice. And uh, for everyone else, thank you guys for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe. New videos coming every week. Don't want to miss these videos. We'll see you next time.